Ivan Eisen one, which is minutes of meeting held on the 15th of November. Uh, 
um, now, I was a going to say how much each of the events raised, but they raised over two thousand pounds for the Minister charities. Now that <coughs> takes some to be swimming up and down in the summer, and that's a real achievement. So I just wanted to point that out. Um, there was another congratulations I have to say, which was actually um, it was the first Mayor's Quiz Night of the Year. And uh, congratulations go to Council Swansborough and his team. Council Swansborough. Who were the victors for the evening? Now, for those wishing to seek revenge, the next quiz night will take place on the 20th of April. So I hope you will be there to um, have revenge on Council Swansborough. Um, something that I attended. Uh, for the uh, schools. And I don't know if you know or you've heard of the Rock Challenge. Uh, it took place in it's, uh, su um, the whole of Sussex, the whole of Sussex schools. And it, it took place at Corley in the hall. And we had several local schools that were entered. And so I went along. It was a wonderful evening. It was judged on, it was all the children, and then it was judged on who took part, what they'd done in the community, and the dancing, etc. But I was absolutely delighted to have that the evening was won by Eastbourne Academy, Randall Park. So I think many congratulations, because I was absolutely delighted it being my walk at time. So um, that I wanted to point out. Um, the, the well, next thing I wanted to say is that I'm very conscious of uh, 2018 being the centenary the representation of the people act. And it's the first time working men and the very first women of this country got the vote. Now to mark the International Women's Day on the 8th of March, uh, the Soroptimists have organised a conference taking place here at the Town Hall and it will actually be in support of the Mayor's Charities but it promises to be a fascinating, very informative event. It's an all-day conference, but anybody who can't come the whole day, that's fine. Um, it's uh, high-profile speakers tackling issues such as human trafficking, girls' education, and women in leadership, and hidden, hidden women in school, which is very identified. So I do hope you'll come along. And it's not just open to women. It's <coughs> Everybody's here. Okay. Um, 
I did my public writing address. Uh, we've got uh, two requests to speak um, under the council procedure of the 11, and in respect of a, a couple of motions, two motions that we have that have been item 10. Now, um, I haven't got the names down here. Uh, yes, uh, Mr. Finney, this is the names of the people. Yeah, just to, just to say that we have uh, Mr. Oliver Sterner, who is going to speak on the Classics Free Campaign motion in item 10A, and Mr. Dennis Scarr, who's going to speak on the uh, uh, Planning Committee Speaker's motion uh, at item 10A. Thank you very much for the report, David. Um, I wasn't going to offer the order of business, so we'll go on with the uh, item 7, which is the Council budget and the uh, council matter. We've got this for Yes? Could you move it? Yes, I formally move the motion on that budget. Thank you. Do you have a second? Councillor Clark. I will second the last to reserve on that speech later. Thank you. Are there any amendments? was so close to financial meltdown that they had to issue a section 114 notice prohibiting all but essential expenditure. And East Sussex County Council have just had to agree the most savage cuts to their social care budgets at a time when more people need their help than ever before. Eastbourne Borough Council has different responsibilities, but the financial pressure is just as acute, so maybe it's not about how you tackle it. Last year, I stood before you all accepting the fact that Eastbourne Borough Council needed to play its part in attempting to overcome the financial challenges faced by the country. That hasn't changed. I also voiced my frustration with the timing of government announcements concerning financial settlements. That hasn't changed either. Yet again, this has caused us major problems, and I'm fed up with central government passing responsibility for all the tax increases to local government, thus making them the bad boys in the eyes of the public. Still, I don't imagine that's going to change any time soon. Officers started working on this year's budget as far back as last July. And by the time we got to December's cabinet meeting, we had a draft budget. And although there was still a gap of £163,000, we were confident that we would find the extra savings and have a balanced budget by today's deadline. But what did December, December's government announcement bring us? Yet another change to the new homes bonus, money which is paid to councils in recognition of new homes built in their patch. Last year, this changed from six years' worth of payments to five, and it has now been reduced still further to four years. This meant that a payment we were expecting of 200,000 pounds the houses that were built in 2014-15 would no longer be forthcoming. When we agreed a few years ago to move to a four-year settlement agreement, it was supposed to give us some certainty and the ability to plan longer term. Changing the goalposts partway through the game just reintroduces uncertainty and is another tactic I deplore. The same government announcement also gave a pay award to local authority employees of 2%, which I will say now is long overdue and well deserved, but gave us no help in finding the extra £100,000 this equates to if it is accepted. So, at a stroke, and very late in the day, our £163,000 gap has suddenly grown to £463,000. Other recent changes have hit us hard too. We used to receive money in the form of specific grants, for example, the homelessness grant and the grant for flood defence. 
These and others have now been subsumed into the main grant. Another £300,000 or so that we no longer receive. But there was good news as well. Good for councils, maybe, not so good for council taxpayers. Councils would now be able to charge an additional 1% on council tax without having a referendum. An additional 1% on council tax means an extra £80,000 for us. So now we only needed to find an extra £383,000 to the drawing board. At this point, I would like to officially record my very grateful thanks to our Chief Finance Officer, Alan Osborne, and his team. They did indeed go back to the drawing board, and after re-evaluating every potential saving and income target, they presented us with new figures, which have been agreed and incorporated into the budget I'm presenting to you this evening. This year has been our biggest challenge yet. There are two reasons for this. The scarcity of resources I have already highlighted, and the fact that however entrepreneurial we are, and we are, it takes a while for income to start being generated. <coughs> we have a number of schemes already in the pipeline, but unfortunately they won't start generating income in time for the 1819 budget. As we set the budget for 1819, we held true to a number of principles that are underpinned by sound financial management. Our budget aims to maintain our frontline services, benchmark fees and services in line to other councils and with inflation, maintain a strategic change fund to finance the transformation program in order to increase efficiency, use borrowing to support the capital program on a business case basis, and continue to use priority-based budgeting in our view, this is a much better method of deciding budget reductions than the salami slicing method favoured by other councils. And of course, we will continue to identify new income streams <coughs> to supplement the ever-diminishing resources. Our budget requirement for next financial year will be £13.5 million, pounds, down by a million from this time last year. This is funded from several different sources. Firstly, we anticipate a contribution of a million pounds from a joint pooling initiative. Then there is the rate support grant, which now only accounts for 400,000 pounds, with another 400,000 coming from the new homes bonus. Other grants bring in 100,000 pounds, while retained business rates account for 3.4 million. The remaining 8.2 million will come from council tax. In order to meet this budget requirement, there is the usual mix of unavoidable growth, savings and income generation. I will deal with the unavoidable growth first. There are a number of additional costs each year, some of which are avoid unavoidable, like inflation on contracts the council has with suppliers. This is written into the contract and usually kept in line with inflation. And there have been the usual requests for more money for specific projects or new initiatives. This year we recognise the continuing financial challenges that many families face, and so have agreed to additional money for homelessness, as well as a hardship support fund. It is important too that we take a long-term view and continue to look for more ways of increasing our income. To this end, we have also allocated money to assessments and viability reports that will help us decide on future projects that either aid income generation for the council or further the economic development of our town. My job, and that of my cabinet colleagues, is to ensure that these requests really are unavoidable. And in doing so, we take account of the economic climate and the impact it's having on the residents of the town. In total, we've had to find £1.2 million to offset these increased costs. <coughs> a big part of any budget is the element of savings. So where have we found savings? The transformation programme that started two years ago aimed to combine this council's functions and staff with that of Lewis District Council. The senior management team is now working effectively across both councils <coughs> and departmental managers have recently been appointed. We're now in phase two, which is where most of next year's efficiency savings will come from, a whopping half a million pounds. 
We have implemented the planned cut to the Town of Art Gallery. Not universally popular, I know, but our reducing <coughs> contribution to the Town of Trust was highlighted very clearly in the Cabinet paper of July the 10th, 2013. This has generated a saving of £200,000. A range of smaller savings have also been identified by departmental managers. Not an easy job when we're already pretty much true to the bone, but as we all know, every penny counts. Income generation is an area of our business that we've worked hard on in recent years, and colleagues will be aware of the many schemes that are generating income for us over and above any costs involved. Examples of this are our, our, our property portfolio, run by our very professional corporate landlord team and new property company. This now includes Victoria Mansions, the Buccaneer Park, and Hampton Park Retail Park, <coughs> among others. And we anticipate over £2 million income after costs next year from all our assets. This has proved to be a very successful extension of our business and one which many councils up and down the land have embraced. Two other small companies that we started will be contributing in the region of £80,000. But I cannot talk about income generation without referring to Solarborn. This is our... This, well, I can't, can I? This was our first attempt at income generation, and thanks to our well-deserved reputation as the sun trap of the South, continues to contribute significant amounts to the budget. Next year we are anticipating contributions over and above costs of £150,000. Next year we'll see the introduction of a green garden waste collection charge. We had hoped to avoid charging for this, but it was made very clear when the sale of the down and farm leases was proposed that this would be one of the consequences of not going ahead with the sale. Given that it is an opt-in service, and currently the 21,000 households who don't have a brown bin are contributing to those who do, we consider this to be the best choice from several unpalatable alternatives. This should generate an excess of £400,000 and is based on a prudent estimate of the take-up rate. In total, we have identified £2 million worth of savings and increases in income. When we look at any council spending, it falls into two categories, statutory and discretionary. Statutory services are those we are obliged to provide by law, for example, waste collection and benefit administration. And discretionary are the services that we choose to provide, examples of which are our tourism and event spending and community budgets. When we look at our discretionary areas of spending, as we have to do each year as part of the budget process, we have to balance their costs with the benefits they provide. In spite of the very serious challenges we have faced in the preparation of this budget, I can confirm that we will continue to fund the devolved war budget scheme at the same level as last year. In other words, £10,000 per ward. The introduction of devolved war budgets has been very successful and has funded a large number of small projects and events across our town that would not otherwise have happened. We also recognise the significant contribution that our partners in the community make to the well-being of our town, and I'm able to confirm the continuation of our other community grants for the coming year. We will be committing another £508,000 on top of the devolved board budget through a variety of community grants. These will contribute to the work of the 3VA, the Salvation Army and the Systems Advice Bureau as well as continue the fund to which charities can apply for help with smaller projects across the town. We will also continue to top up the rent support scheme to the tune of almost £137,000 and set aside just over £52,000 for discretionary rate relief. This continued support for our voluntary partners would not be possible without sound financial management and our commitment to the work they do. A word now about our reserves. All good budgeting requires something in the rainy day fund, something to fall back on, and the council is no different. Our chief finance officer recommends holding a minimum reserve of two million pounds. This is on top of any earmarked reserves or money set aside to support specific projects. 
we are prudently planning to keep our general reserves at 3 million next year in order to help us ride out the current storm, <coughs> as well as to invest in any one-off investments that may arise. This policy has served us well in the last few years and I see no reason to change it. In addition to our general fund reserve, we will maintain the strategic change fund for a further year to support the transformation program and we will also continue to hold a small regeneration reserve. As I highlighted before, the biggest contribution to our budget is now the council tax. In order to meet our budget requirements, we will be raising council tax by just under the amount allowed by legislation, in other words, by 2.9%. This means an increase of £6.75 per year, equating to just under 13p per week. This rise allows us to keep pace with inflation, which is currently running at 3%. A Band D resident will now pay £239.67 to Eastbourne Borough Council out of a council tax bill of nearly £1,900. This represents just 12.6% of the total. Although most of my speech has, has been concerned with the revenue budget, I will, as usual, make reference to the capital programme. The Council's capital programme is funded from capital receipts, grants and contributions. We are also allowed to borrow on a business case basis, where savings on new income from a scheme can repay the cost of borrowing. Our ambitious Devonshire Park project is progressing well and is due for completion next year. The newly built tennis facilities were ready in time for the annual Aegon Tennis Tournament last June and the players were very appreciative of the new modern facilities. The town centre development funded by League and General is really taking shape now and is on target to be completed in the autumn. We are currently scoping the plans for the new Sovereign Centre and hope to agree the finances and time scales soon. Our financial plans are ambitious and quite rightly subject to independent scrutiny. BDO are the external auditors currently charged with ensuring that our accounts are honest, robust and sustainable. They confirmed this in their report of October last year. And I quote, we are satisfied that the council has appropriate arrangements to continue to remain financially sustainable over the period of the medium term financial strategy. So, to summarise, our budget proposals include dealing with the reduction in government funding of £1.8 million. They include overall savings and new income totaling £2.1 million. <coughs> there are efficiency savings of more than half a million, new and increased income of £1.6 million, inflation and unavoidable costs of £800,000, other recurring service growth of 400,000, <coughs> non-recurring service investments from general reserves of half a million, general reserves averaging over 3 million against a recommended 2 million, capital resources of 300,000 invested in new capital schemes, and an increase in the council tax of 2.9%, which I must emphasise gives us no additional income, but just keeps pace with inflation. All of this has been achieved by the transformation of the way our services are delivered, by embracing new <coughs> technology, by joining forces with another council, by the entrepreneurial spirit that we have displayed, and by sound financial management and monitoring. <coughs> we have avoided the need to use our reserves for recurring expenditure, unlike other councils, and we have maintained our frontline services when nearby councils are having to cut theirs. In my first budget speech 10 years ago, I can hardly believe 10 years ago, I was moaning about only having a 0.5% increase in government grant. <laughs> a year later, a 0.8% increase gave us a government grant of £10.42 million. If I had known then that eight years later we would only be receiving a paltry £4.3 million, I think I would have refused council task development opportunities. <laughs> but we have weathered the storm and weathered it better than many other councils due to our sound financial management, 
our talented senior management team, and our entrepreneurial spirit. And as I finish what is definitely my last budget speech this year, I stand here very proud of what this administration has achieved over the last 11 years. I commend this budget to you. Thank you.
interest rates must, at some time soon, return to a degree of normality. These more realistic levels of interest would mean a potentially large increase in the amount the council has to pay annually to service their increasing level of borrowers. And if it needs refinancing, who knows what interest rates will be by then. We would certainly agree that the council should have capital projects, but can this administration be trusted to deliver them effectively? For example, we still have no wish to have restaurant, as this project seems to have stagnated. Is the council capable of making the best use of the borough assets? Is it capable of spending wisely and making the decisions that are best for Eastbourne? Thank you. Thank you. Does anyone wish to speak on the budget? Oh, I'm expecting. Well, that's the job of the Oh, that's the thing. Why not? <laughs> I heard a few things there that I'm quite interested in. One was uh, income generation. You know, really, Madam Mayor, I do hope it works. Two million next year. And of course, it has already been mentioned about the Wish Tower, the restaurant. Uh, how long ago was that? Three years ago, demolished for no reason. No reason I was there and looked at it, and no, it had to be demolished. There's no future for it, and I can't really see, there's some promises, but I can't really see any future for that. Um, and in some ways, the Buccaneer, that was mentioned, the Buccaneer Park. You had a visit to that, I'm sure many councillors here had a visit to that, and saw that the parking flooring had been re sanded and the carpets. They've all been clean, and I thought there's a business that's going to get going. Then my local shopkeeper says, Why has the buccaneer closed? It's closed. Door, door shut, closed. I'm sure it's just temporary, but let's hope so. Hope not a lot of this now. And then we have uh, Victoria Mansions that was mentioned. That's an interesting one. I, uh, I'm fully supportive of spending five million on that block to make sure there's a good income. And I'm assuming the income would have been about 300,000 a year. But I noticed there were three or four shops empty. So I made inquiries uh, as to why they're empty at the moment. And actually, there was another shop owner nearby, whether he wanted to expand or wanted to know a bit of information. Wanted to know whether it was being advertised when I made inquiry. No, there's uh, more money to be spent on Victoria Mansions before we get. So there's more money going to be pumped in to these projects. Uh, uh, and I just, you know, I really do hope for the big release form that there is going to be a two million uh, income from this uh, massive uh, project. It could be 150 to 200 million borrowing. And I hope there will be that. And then we've heard also we're going to have a nice new sovereign centre. Now I sit on the strategic property board, as some people may, uh, may know here, and I saw two presentations. One to refer what we have for 10 million, got money. A lot of people I spoke to, they said, well, it does, doesn't need tidying up. It's a bit, it's a bit dirty and tidy. Right. What you could do, 10 million. No, that's not the decision that's been made. The decision's been made to demolish it and then spend 25 million on a brand new swimming pool. I'm, I do hope it will be brilliant. It's not built yet, but what? What is? What? I remember the Sovereign Centre being built. I know it was a. a, a, a a swimming, a swimming pool originally, and it's expanded at the end. But can I tell you, when I saw the plan, it was an awful job to try and get hold of the plans of the refurb of that for 10 million. It was fantastic. But no, that was kicked away, and we go for the brand new 25 million swimming pool. Can I say, Madam Mayor, I just hope 
this uh, income regeneration, I should be watching it very, very closely, works for the people of Eastbourne. Because I think nowadays you've got to be extremely careful about borrowing money and making sure that whatever you invest, uh, you get an income and you run it correctly. And I don't think councils in the past have ever been very, very good at uh, running businesses, but we'll see what actually happens. Sorry about the mayor. Couldn't resist, couldn't resist some of those points. And there's probably a few more, but time's running short. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, anybody else wish to speak? Yeah, well, years ago, I always described the Tories as a, uh, their budget as a, as a full fairyland, I think. It's a fantasy. And today we haven't even had the fantasy before, because we haven't seen an amendment yet. And so I'm really uh, worried. I'm really worried for us as a council. I'm worried that we've got a council budget, major budget coming forward. We haven't seen an amendment. You know, we all have different views. I'm sure we an opposition to come up with something that has to help you, maybe paint the council chamber a different colour or something, I don't know, but they would have, have that. We haven't seen that. What we've seen is what I think is a little bit of hypocrisy. Councillor Dikara said that they'd only had a presentation of a, a slideshow or whatever it was. Well, actually, I think the Conservatives should look at themselves because in another council not too far from here, They've been making decisions in a vacuum. So surely they could do that here if that's what they're saying they've got. So I really do think that we're in a situation where we, the majority group, <coughs> really pay extra, extra attention in putting our budget together because we know the opposition aren't capable of really looking at it in, in real terms. There's a, I know there's people who add up sums in various ways, such as uh, all the damage part work, and that could be debated and whatever, but this isn't the place for that at the moment. But when we look at all the various schemes the council have, councillors have access to a lot of information. They come here and they pretend or move things slightly so that they say, well, this is that. They know that in reality that what they're suggesting isn't quite on the mark. I won't uh, say things that get me reported to standards, so uh, I think we need to just be cautious. Do you know the Wish Tower was demolished not because it was great, a great building standing there by Freely Councillor, it was standing there by the will of God. That's the reason it was standing there. It was about to fall down. No. It was right. absolutely appalling. Right. And I was in that building and I would not go in there again. So it was a danger. We did that to save the public from a public danger. When it comes to um, when it comes to the council's budget here, Council Matic has put forward an excellent budget. And because we know that we've got a poor opposition. She's gone through it and gone through it, spoken to her colleagues, and worked really, really well. I think that at the end of the whole exercise of budget setting, the thing that will always tell you a way forward, how has the approach been over the last 10 years? The approach has been that we will look at the council, we will look at how we can improve the services, we will look at how we can save the town from massive cuts imposed by central government, and it is imposed by central government, because of this view that uh, they're going to move council tax onto the well, taxation of local service onto local people, but they're not actually giving us a corresponding cut in national tax. They're moving it from a broader base tax to a narrow tax that only affects the council tax payer, so it's falling on fewer shoulders. So, you know, the argument's going on this, that, and other. The fact is that council taxpayers are disproportionately paying more than they used to have to pay. So, I really do think that at the end of it all, we need to say to ourselves, because of the lack of real opposition and real scrutiny on this, we need to be doubly sure 
Now, I know Councillor Matter has done that, so that's why I would commend this budget to you. And if anyone says to me, well, we didn't have the information, I'll ask, why didn't they have the information? If they didn't ask for it, they wouldn't get it. If they asked for it and didn't get it, what steps have they taken to get it? Because I've asked questions in another council, I didn't get the answers, so I've gone to have to go through freedom of information request. That's the sort of thing you have to do. If you're in opposition and you're looking at things, you need to make sure you have that information. But all we have is a void. So, I'm sorry, the void I'm talking about, obviously, is the opposition here. Thank you. Um, is there anybody else wishes to speak on this? Councillor Hong. I, uh, I had some time off yesterday, and uh, rather than doing what I should, should do, and I thought I wanted to just relax and run some of my thought, I'm going to sit down and I'm going to Google budget cuts by our councils across the UK just to see what our councils have to cut, what they're having to do, and how much they're to say. And I tried to do it non political so I've gone for Alton, which uh, is uh, Lake Control, 22.5 million over three years. Uh, that means it cuts community grants by 50,000 pounds. Swindon, Conservative Control, cutting 30 million pounds over three years. They're looking at uh, getting the 400 members of staff. Darlington, now this was a little bit historic, so I've got to be so that, but it might have one of those chief executive perhaps, which is, uh, in 2006, I announced that this year's budget for community bonds would be only £15,000 per year, and in order to make further savings, the chief executive has decided to retire. <laughs> 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 Council Jenkins stood up and said that they had a plan, budget, and they were going to tell us that budget plan when they were ready. Yeah. We're now you're on, looking forward to it later on. Council Jenkins. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, the final thing is, um, I know the Councillor Ricardo stated um, about the fact that Green Waste and asked us to look at what's going to be for a year. As Councillor Takara knows, and, and Councillor Matic, we've been in town for many years, the Council has an obligation to balance the books. And Councillor Takara has explained to us how, by reducing that funding, by removing the 52 pounds a year charge, she would have that uh, balanced. Um, as for Councillor Taylor earlier on, talking to us about how we can't run businesses, not here or there, but I was pointing out that solar born was a uh, policy that uh, preceded uh, my term in this council, the one which this council is very proud of, and rightly so, which was once again rejected by the opposition group. Mm -hmm. So I just want to leave those kind of thoughts with everybody. Thank you. Councillor Now. Thank you, Councillor Now. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I just want to make a few points. Um, I noted that comments about it being no easy task. I felt that was a bit of an understatement, Councillor uh, Dakar. Um, and I know that there's a feeling that we shouldn't keep mentioning the, the budget cuts, but obviously that's central to the changes in how the kind of funding is for local councils. Um, a couple of points of clarification, really, that when we consider the council tax as a whole, 87% of the council tax collected goes to services provided to Communities, so we have a fire service, police service, and so on. Only 13% comes to the council. The cuts to uh, local council are coming faster and more severe than our ability to be able to create wealth, so we have to look for efficiency savings. So, my feeling about the budget is it's very balanced. It demonstrates savings through efficiency, so we think about joint partnerships, joint working partnerships, and particularly with Lewis District Council. It looks at investments which are supported by business cases through people like Alan Osborne, Chief Financial Officer people with huge experience and, and uh, a lifetime of career of knowledge. And it's also uh, scrutiny through BDO. So I would say we've got every approach covered to have every possible um, investment to be as positive as possible. And when you consider something like Solar Born creating £150,000 of positive income to the, to the 
Council, you can see that some of the investments we make actually are incredibly positive to the, to the, to the income to the Council now. Um, in terms of the £52 per household um, per bin, uh, just because you commented it, I'm a lead member, you're absolutely right. I did, when asked by Councillor Belsey and Councillor Freebody, understand at the time that the contract was per household. When the contract was then uh, came up through the officer's findings, and this wasn't an intentional error, but this was a, a, a misadvice from uh, an officer to myself, and you know that they've apologised for that and explained that. Um, and absolutely right, it is per bin. Now, the intention is very much to move that back once we have the uh, waste collection service in-house to being a per house charge rather than a per bin charge. That is the intention. I also just wanted to express my disappointment in the lack of detail from the opposition in terms of their uh, rebuttal to the budget. I just find it um, a bit incredulous that we don't have the specific detail that you would do things differently. And to say that you don't have the information available to you, I think is a shame, because it's a democracy. There are officers who are available to answer any questions you might have. There is no hidden agenda. And to, uh, to imply that there is one, I think is a bit disappointing, to say the least. Every investment, sovereign centre, um, uh, Devonshire Ward, Devonshire Quarter, uh, is supported by a business case. And so the reason why the Sovereign Centre was um, uh, it's been agreed to be uh, demolished and rebuilt is because the business case stacks up. It is more beneficial to the council, generates more income, more revenue for the council in the face of, 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 of grant cuts than it would have done had you spent £10 million renovating the existing building. <coughs> so the business cases aren't designed by us, they're designed by us in, 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 in partnership with the officers to ensure that we have every opportunity to make every investment as successful as possible. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Jenkins. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, actually, it's not going to go into great detail, but I'll, it's really it's a question that uh, I've been asked uh, by one or two of the residents, some in my, in my neighbourhood, some in other neighbourhoods. It's to do with your garden waste collection and you put your, your requirement for things to pay for it. Um, the question I've been asked is that if they've got a back garden <coughs> um, and just outside that back garden there are trees which are in council property effectively because they're on the public area. Um, once or twice a year, well it's mainly once a year in the autumn when all the leaves start to fall and the leaves tend to fall into people's back gardens. Um, if they don't take up the offer of your bin or the composting uh, bin that you're suggesting they might apply for, um, what is their option? Because quite honestly, effectively, it is your property that is falling in private land. Therefore, um, the idea that perhaps they might just put it over the wall, out onto the uh, grass, um, really, it's a question that, as I say, has been asked. It's one I've got to say I've got a great deal of sympathy for it as well. Um, as anyone who knows the area where I live, there are quite a few trees jutting onto people's back gardens. Um, really, what is the option? If you don't take it up, you're paying, or if you take it up, you're paying 52 pounds, probably one collection a year. Um, but if you don't take it up, what do you do with basically what you're going to do?
12 years ago <laughs> under a different, 12 years ago under a different administration, you were charging 26 pounds a year for um, household waste. Bit of bit inflation at the time and a bit of hypocrisy about it as well. Uh, in direct response to what she said, everyone who wishes not to have a brown bin is going to be offered a free composter. So they can compost it. But really why I stood up is to how proud I am of the group I belong to. Because we're keeping our funding for the voluntary organisations. We're creating a fund for homelessness. Creating a hardship fund. The sad part of it is we were needed because of the huge cutback to social services we just had in the last county council budgets. We would need every bit of funding we have to pick up the slack on the cutback, which comes down from government, yet it is such exemptive proposals. So I congratulate our group in putting money where it's needed and being a socially conscious group.
uh, I, I've challenged um, the management in terms of where have the cost overrun from 44 million pounds and Devonshire Park to 49 million pounds been reported? It has never been reported to this council. I don't believe it's been reported to cabinet. And finally, since John Ungar, Count Ungar, referred to the Devonshire Park project, I'll just give you some simple numbers because we have a screening committee meeting on it. And the, num the view is that all these projects apparently cover the potential debt on them. Now, even if you use 44 million, let's take 3%. You can see that that cost is 1.2 million at least. Right? The incremental revenue from the Devonshire Park project, when we scrutinize it, is only 0.8 million. Thank you very much. <coughs> All right, I'm point of puzzle explanation. Actually, I did say that these, these figures could be looked at in another place because we could all add up in different ways. Council Smart has added up in one way that maybe the way schools they turn out. Oh, sorry. 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 There are alternatives. 
We could look at alternate weekly by England. Not popular, but nothing we do as far as this is concerned popular. Charging for the Green Guard waste is not going to be popular. Alternative black fin collections will not be popular. But what are we going to do? I mean, look at the bigger picture. We will keep all our bins if we have an alternative weekly collection. Okay, so there's no brown bins to collect. We will increase our recycling rates. Excellent. Excellent. We can take above 40% for a permanent. And we we'll can still confidence in local residents that we are serious about the environment. Many councils have gone into this system now. Alternate weekly collections. It's not ideal, especially if we have no food waste collection. But if we're going to invest in potential composters of people to, to help with the garden waste, we can invest in the food can and cook your got your food waste. We can invest in those as well. And of course we all know we don't know the future. But we do know the future of local government finance will be tighter. So we could be in a situation where we do have to do both. We may well be in a situation where we have to do black bin collections, as well as shopping garden waste, or let's do the black bin collections first. And if we have to do the garden waste charging, that can come later. But at least we have an opportunity <coughs> to get these to the and safeguard our recycling rates. Of course, taxation is never fair. There are households in this town paying for my, my garden waste collection service. But I don't have children. I'm happy handing over my tax money to educate our children and our hospitals. I'm, I'm happy. I'm sorry, I'm never that to be Okay, I'll just summarise. This is a, uh, it's sadness that I have to make this speech. Uh, it goes against my principles, and I wish it had been avoided. Thank you. Thank you very much. Councillor Nelson. Hey, Madam Mayor. Um, <laughs> I, was, I was hoping Councillor Wallace would speak before I did. Um, and I was sitting here waiting for him to put his hand up. I didn't realise you had Councillor Wallace to stand here. A couple of points. I mean, I've been on this council over the years for quite a few years as well. And that's the first time ever in all my years on this council, either in lead members team or the opposition members team, that somebody has complained that the opposition did not put an alternative budget. <laughs> I'm absolutely amazed um, that you're, you're worried that we haven't put an alternative. There are reasons for that, and I'm sure that uh, Councillor Freeboy will use fine. But I'm also <laughs> very worried about, well, you know, you know, um, about the green waste. The green waste situation, um, yes, I use it, and, and, and I was one of the early ones to sign up for the 26 quid when we first started it in 2000. Yeah. Um, and it's been a very good service, a very good service, it will be paid for. What worries me is exactly, um, as Councillor Wallace has explained, um, lack of take up, green waste going into the black things, green waste ending up the alleyways, we can go and go to the walls, in the council of Jenkins, my dear, or you know, wherever. Um, I, just, I just worry immensely about this decision. Um, I haven't gone as far as to suggest that uh, we went to um, alternate black bin collection. But if you're looking at that, that's fine. What I didn't realise, and I don't know if anybody else did, is something that Councillor Dow said. And that was in regard to going back to having a free green waste collection. Um, that was news to me. Sorry? That was a household. Oh, it was a dream, was it? <laughs> oh, well, you dream. You dream. <laughs> well, no, I'm dreaming of my holiday. But, um, <laughs> I'm sorry, I, I did think you said that. I thought you said that when the, when the new waste collection was sorted out, there was a chance that we might go back to a free round. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I got that wrong. I apologise. But I still, I still feel that, um, as, as Councillor um, Dakara said, if, if, if you feel that you could take this back, it's funny. I think, you know, your reserves have gone up. Why can't you? If we're going to have a new contract, we're going to go back to doing it ourselves as, as in-house collections and things like that. Why can't we just take out uh, that amount of money to keep that waste going this year and 
just review where you are. Um, that's, that's, I'm only asking, you can still make that decision. You can change the budgets, we all know that. Um, but I do, I do ask out uh, there through you that perhaps the leading, the leading party can re-look at where we are on the green. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else? Oh, sorry, Councillor. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I've sat here tonight actually with no intention to speak in this debate. Certainly, when I heard that there was no opposition uh, coming forward uh, in terms of an alternative budget, uh, and I was asking myself why that was. Of course, we all know why that is because actually the budget that Councillor Matter has moved tonight is a very sound budget, <coughs> a very good budget for Eastbourne. And actually, even the opposition, they may not publicly admit this, but they know it's a good budget, they know it's a sound budget, uh, and they know that it contains a lot of things which, frankly, they couldn't object to uh, because they know they are good for the people of Eastbourne, and we're going into all of that. Well, the reason I've got up is I can't actually believe that we're getting opposition from people like Councillor Belsley and Councillor Taylor tonight with our budget. Given the backcloth, given the fact that it's only a few days since we had the County Council uh, budget meeting, and if we make the contrast, and we heard earlier on, Councillor Mackett set out the backdrop for us in Eastbourne, and the way in which we've approached budgeting, and the way in which we have planned to make sure that we were not having to, uh, to make uh, devastating cuts to frontline services, all the planning that's gone in, it's such a massive contrast with what's gone on at the County Council, where without going through everything that's happened there, but it's a matter of record, the devastating cuts to adult social care and, and uh, the threats over closure of homes, the threats over libraries, all the things that are happening there, which frankly are something that concerns many people in the town. The one area in which, in the only area as far as I can see, that you've been able to, to land on tonight is on green waste and on the collection there. And I, I accept, I agree, that's not something that any of us, frankly, on either side of the chamber, particularly want to introduce. But if we got to a point where we managed to balance the budget and we managed to come, here, to come up with uh, lots of proposals which have <coughs> meant that we haven't had to bring in really devastating cuts here in Eastbourne, that the worst that you can come at us with is the fact they have to make a charge, which is not something we want to do, but frankly, something that we're, that we're having to do in order to, to make sure we bring in that additional revenue. Councillor Penny Picara said, well, he doesn't want to see us do that. Well, you've got to come forward with your alternatives. You've got to show where that potential ending the ballpark of £400,000. Where's that money coming from? So what's your alternative? We haven't heard an alternative tonight from any Conservative. We've heard a little bit of picking here and there about various things, but we've heard no positive contribution uh, at all. So I would be, frankly, if I was sitting where you are tonight, I'd be embarrassed about the contrast with what we've seen at the County Council, and Councillor Belsey shaking his head. He obviously isn't embarrassed about what's going on there. He isn't concerned about what's happening with the homes in Eastbourne. He isn't concerned about our libraries that are closing up. None of that is, is really worrying me particularly. It is worrying me, it's worrying my Madam colleagues. Mayor, on the point of order, um, that is a different place and uh, that's not what we were talking about, so. Okay, if I may continue. Uh, the, the point which I'm trying to make is that all councils up and down the country are having to make difficult decisions at the moment. Uh, Councillor Dakara doesn't seem to have a problem with the fact that the council's been asked to make those difficult decisions and grant has been withdrawn on any. Her colleagues, her Conservative colleagues, the council will actually would differ from her because they actually do think that that's the wrong direction of travel from the government. But in terms of what we're doing in Eastbourne, we have avoided all of that. We've actually put forward a balanced budget which has combined lots of different measures which have been well articulated by Councillor Matter. And I'm really pleased and proud of what we're putting forward and what we are achieving here for the people of Eastbourne. And I'm very disappointed 
in, in the opposition such as it is tonight. Thank you. All right. Are we ready to go to Councillor Tom? Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry, Councillor Greenwood. Thank you very much, Madam Mayor. <laughs> okay, so let's start with the national picture. So there's a reason that local government finances have been, have been reduced, and that's because the national picture with deficit and debt. So 2009-10, the national deficit, which is the deficit um, the government gets in payments, um, was 154.8 billion pounds, or 10.1% of GDP. We fast forward to 2016-17, that's now reduced to 46.9 billion, or 2.4% of GDP. Now, we can, we have to live within our means. Nobody wants to see, I think, on any side. Chamber, in, in fact, in, in any council chamber, anyway, a reduction in money from central government. But we have to live within our means. And when I say live within our means, that's something that's worrying me slightly um, with the party opposite. Councillor Shuttleworth said, um, was talking about the uh, saying that uh, we were doing a little bit of picking here and there. But actually, if you look at 2020, 2021, with the net borrowing, if you think 204.7 billion pounds worth of net borrowing debt that this council will have is a little bit of picking here and there. I'm sorry, did you say billion? 204.7 million. Did I say billion? Yes. <laughs> it could be in the phrase, but that's just a joke. It's <laughs> a little bit of picking here and there, and I'm afraid you'll say you'll say my worry, a couple of worries. So my worry really is about the council's ability to manage um, its debt and manage its capital project. But some of the things at the moment, so as Councillor Takara was saying, in 2015, the net borrowing for this year, or for last year, sorry, or this financial year, was 58.3 million. That's now 124 million. As I said, in 2021, that will raise to 204 million. The commercial investments that this council are making, so the 18 million pounds into Hannibal Retail Park, um, that's a risky adventure. I did say that at the time. Um, if you only look, B&Q are already starting to cut jobs. That's the main um, rental on that site, the main lease on that site. Map bins, already in the last few days, 2,500 jobs, possibly at risk. Um, when they say the Liberal Democrat administration said they are forward thinking, well, actually, forward thinking, do you think the retail parks are the way of the future? With Amazon and the way that um, we shop these days and uh, our lives are led these days, if you think giant retail parks are the way of the future, then I think in a way you're slightly blinkered and mistaken. Of course, I believe that we have to invest, and actually, the Liberal Democratic Council are investing in such things. But if you take Devonshire Park, for example, that was originally what, a £40 million pound scheme? No, it was £40 million pound when it first started. It's now £49, net £49 million. Pound. And I would bet my bottom dollar that it's not the end figure that comes up. So when Councillor Taylor talks about the sovereign cents being a um, £25 million pound scheme, at the rate that Devonshire Park has increased, that the sovereign cents will be about £30.5 million pounds at this rate when it's finished. And that's my problem. And Councillor Ranga said that Devonshire Park, I think one of the things Councillor Ranga said was uh, it should not be discussed here, but really I thought a £49 million pound scheme in a budget, with a capital budget, is exactly the right place to discuss this. And when you spoke about getting the information for a budget, one of the things you said we do in other places, you get an FOI request. So you're basically telling us that the only way we can get the information we want is to put in an FOI request. Didn't say that. Well, you did say that you have to put in an FOI request, so that's what we could do. We shouldn't have to put in an FOI request, Councillor Robert. We should have to get those figures straight away. So you've told us um, about how to get those figures, but it's not exactly transparent, is it? Um, Councillor Derry spoke about household uh, green waste. Um, we know the reason why uh, there's no hidden agenda there. But one thing I would say on green waste, and I think it was Council Matter saying 21,000 people in Eastbourne are subsidised in those who use the green waste bins. 
But actually, that's what counter-tax bands are for. So actually, if you're on a band A, you're most likely in a flat with our guard, paying a lot less than someone on a band B or even band H. And your council tax goes up incrementally because you've got a bigger house, bigger garden, you're going to be using green waste more. Well, surely that's the increment you want to use it on, not just another tax thrill through the back door. Um, I could go on, but I'm about, I think, my time's up. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Now, yeah, it is Councillor Dakara. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, Councillor Dakara, in her opening statement, uh, talked about not wanting to hear complaints about less money in central government. Well, I joined with the Conservative leaders of Wildon, of Robber, of Lewis, uh, Deputy Leader Councillor Alvin from East Sussex, and the Labour Leader from Hastings, in a campaign saying, Stand up for East Sussex. And I hope that she's all through with that. Because actually, the government have had a relentless campaign of taking money away from local authorities, which, meaning, which means that they can no longer, in many cases, provide for the local communities. We know about Northamptonshire, it's been mentioned before. Uh, not only are they now in special measures, only today we read that they've been warned against <coughs> setting their budget because doing so may be an illegal act. That's a Conservative County Council. If Council Nicara doesn't think things have gone too far in terms of the way that national government puts austerity onto local government, uh, I must disagree with this theory. Um, look, turning to green waste, we've heard about the arguments on green waste. Uh, no one's actually want to charge green waste collection, garden waste collection. And uh, I listened to Councillor Wallace's uh, comments, which I respect, uh, because I know how sincere he is about those. The Councillor Bell's talking about uh, his fears of introducing a charge. When we took control of the Council, Madam Mayor, in 2007, there was a charge that he and his colleagues put in for the collection of green waste. It was us that abolished it. And who knows, we may not be able to abolish it again if the government changes its uh, relentless attack on our finances. Uh, Councillor Jenkins asked about what happens to the person who only has one bank or has to get rid of the rubbish once a year. Well, Councillor Jenkins, they can do what many people do anyway in many places, and that's drive to the local household waste site and deposit it there. Uh, we won't be out of step with Conservative authorities in East Sussex. I don't know if there are going to be most of the motion going to Lewis and to uh, Wildon and to uh, uh, to rather say that they ought to not have charges for garden waste collection, or maybe that's just something that is a luxury of opposition here in East uh, The members talked about income generation. Solar law was mentioned. Well, I can remember when we decided we were going to invest in solar law, the Conservatives put out a tabloid newspaper across East saying that it would bankrupt the town. Not that it would bring in £150,000 a year in additional revenue over and above the cost. So I'm quite happy to stand by our record in terms of business investment. And that applies to the other <coughs> sites that were mentioned as well. To Victoria Mansions, which I visited yesterday, which is in need of, of uh, investment in terms of improving it, but will be a, a spectacular part of, of Eastbourne linking our town centre to our seafront. And gives us an opportunity to ensure that the sort of retailers there are not the sort that you wouldn't want, the sort of payday loan companies that all so often find themselves in that sort of part of a, a town. The Sovereign Centre, I've been meeting recently with the Swimming Club, and uh, if we're just refurbished, as Councillor Taylor had said, uh, we've struggled to eradicate the £350,000 a year that the, the centre is uh, subsidised by now. Uh, but not only that, we would have ended up with many months of nowhere to swim in Eastbourne. What a, a sad state of affairs that would be for a, a seaside resort. The Buccaneer. Yes, we bought the Buccaneer. There are waves on the Buccaneer. The Buccaneer, if you look at it, um, the, the part of that goes into the, the Devonshire Park development from the old racket courts. It was not only for investment purposes and income purposes, it was actually make sure that we had control, total control, of the membership art site. Borrowing is wrong if you're going to use it for your ongoing revenue contributions, but it's right if you do it the way that we have. So you've got a capital and appreciating asset and income coming as well. 
Uh, Councillor Taylor talks about repairs and maintenance. He's on the Strategic Property Board. He should know about the investment there. And when we hear about uh, prices going up at Devonshire Park, yes, there's been uh, inflation. But uh, next door relief road from the County Council started off our reminder of less than 50 million pounds, ended up costing 120 million, and all of that came from the council tax payers of East Sussex. Uh, hardly sounds like <coughs> the Conservatives there. Uh, Councillor Rundle didn't talk about FRIs being the only means of getting information. He talked about it as the means he used at the County Council when he wasn't getting information, which allowed us to prepare a budget which would have uh, reduced the cuts that the Conservatives are imposing there by about five million pounds. <laughs> Uh, could you uh, please clearly state whether you are for the 
the budget against the budget or we wish to stay. Okay. Uh, so I'll start off with the mayor. I'm going to abstain. The deputy mayor. Oh. Councillor Ballard. Abstain. Councillor Bannister. Four. Councillor Belsey. Yes. Councillor Chowdhury. Yes. Councillor Colts. Four. Councillor Cara. Four. <laughs> <laughs> Sports 
uh, activities to reduce youth offending. And that's been very successful. A lot of young people have got very positive ways forward on that. We've brought in the new public space protection orders, and those have really helped to sharpen up the council's ability to deal with issues that uh, affect our town overall. We've brought in the business wardens in the sense of giving them more powers to deal with um, antisocial behaviour, especially around the street community, but in particular uh, also dealing with shoplifting. So we've done a, done a lot there, but the, the great bit isn't just what we've achieved, but it's what we're tackling next year. Because our priorities in, in the next year will be um, even greater though more focused. And I think that it's important that we, as a, as a council, work so positively with all our partners to make a success of our coming year. Now, as we know, we work very well with Sussex Police, and we share accommodation, and I spoke with the Police and Crime Commissioner, who's always been very complimentary about that shared working space that we have. And recently there's been a review of the funding of the Community Safety Partnership. People will have read in the paper last week that Eastbourne has been very, very successful. In fact, the most successful council in, in, in the whole of uh, Sussex. It, <coughs> increasing the amount of monies that we get given from the Police and Crime Commissioner to deal with issues on the ground through the Community Safety Partnerships. And that has, it, we've had an increase from the year 2019-20, about 50, 53, 54%. And it's possible, actually, in this coming year, it will also get some action. <coughs> so it means that what we're going to be able to do with our partners is to commission work ahead of the game. So we're not acting in a knee-jerk way, but we're going to be acting in a way that forestalls issues and helps us to uh, work collaboratively. <coughs> And that's one of the successes that this council has had. Now, in this community safety partnership, we've combined that partnership with Lewis. So I'm now the co-chair with Lewis in the new coming year, financial year as well. I'm the co-chair there. And working together, we're so much stronger. And I would say to everyone, this is a great plan. We want to get on with the work of it. And we look forward to getting some extra money in the future. Thank you. Um, Councillor Jenkins, thank you. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I think Councillor Arthur has actually stolen most of the um, most of the other comments I was going to make. And in fact, nice, nice point, nine percent of mine. Uh, but the one thing I would like to add: uh, yes, we completely support this this policy, the the, the crimes, the community safety policy. And from a general point of view, as a member of the general, uh, I'd like to commend the work that they do. Um, my main, re main comment that I'll, I'm left with, or I can't even say, um, is the you know, thank you to the Police and Crime Commissioner Kevin Thorne uh, for slightly more than the, the, the 50. I mean, the 50 is, you start talking about Pan Sussex or Westland. But Eastbourne actually received a 94% increase uh, from 26, just over 26,000 <coughs> to almost 51,000. Uh, for, uh, for the work we do, certainly through the community safety and J. So I think that really does need uh, announcing very, very loudly uh, that we, we seem to be getting it right for what we do here. And the Crime Commissioner, Crime Commissioner has actually accepted that. And well, I think 94% increase uh, shows exactly what, what, uh, what we achieve. <coughs> Thank you. Um, anyone else? Councillor Bannister, did you wish to add? Right, so we can take this to the vote. So those... <laughs> <laughs> right, um, 9B, travel policy, um, Councillor Dean, sorry. Mm -hmm. the, do, you, do you have a second? Oh, thank you. I'd just uh, like to thank the uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. So I'd like to thank the officers who put this together. Um, 
And really the policy is to bring in line uh, the travel policy to both Lewis District Council and the Borough Council. Thank you very much. Did anyone have Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, just uh, a quick question for you, uh, Councillor Sowery. Uh, you may have noticed that uh, I seem to be interested in parking. Um, and <laughs> I just wonder, I just wonder if you could give me an estimate tonight, or perhaps send the detail later on, in terms of how many employees effectively have parking rights in Eastbourne and how many car spaces there are. Thank you. Councillor Sowery, did, did you wish to respond? <laughs> Thank you. Anyone else wish to speak on that? We'll take it to vote. Those in favour? Item nine C, Council Licensing Policy Statement. Uh, review human agility. Report of Council Twitters. Um, uh, do you have a second? Tonight, uh, 
um, that after the last debate may see politics as a um, me, a bit of a bum fight, but actually the licensing committee, it was very mixed. There were members on both sides. Um, I think I changed my mind about three times. Is that right, Councillor Coles? Three times, I think. And, and even now, I can't remember which way I'm going to be. <laughs> but I, I must say, uh, it did start off under Councillor Dale, our had stewardship of the um, licensing committee. Um, we did take our time over it. We looked in great detail. In fact, I think we asked three times for different reports over three different meetings um, for the evidence behind the CIP. Um, so I'd just like to say uh, thank you to all the officers because they had to put all that time into all that extra information um, that we asked for. We did get to a decision. I can't remember which way I voted on that decision. Um, but it was, um, it was very good that the members on all sides could agree, disagree, finally got to a decision. Um, and as Councillor Taylor said um, earlier, it's only got a year anyway, and we've got to be with you, so um, uh, the decision came. We came to the right decision in the end, although I'm not sure to say which way I voted. I can quickly say
Thank you. Anyone else wish to speak? No, we'll go to the door then. Those in favour? And Are there any amendments? No? Okay. So 
So would you mind? Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, we need you to speak first. Okay. Is this a? Do you know how many? I think I do. Right. <laughs> Madam Mayor and members of the council. I've always been involved in the environment and the state of the world, like global warming, coming from a career as a geography teacher. I'm an Eastbourne resident and have been inspired by the blue planet, like millions of others. I did not realise before this that a plastic straw could ruin the life of a turtle. I began constant cleanup. Every Friday, a small but growing group of us cleans up the beach near Holywell Tea Chalet. I set up a web page and a movement, C. That stands for Survival Equals Action. This tries to organise and publicise beach cleaning along our shores and to reduce plastic production and use in the first place. Currently it has 670 members worldwide. I've become increasingly aware of the tidal wave of public interest in this topic, also of the organisations that are coordinating this work, two of which are the Marine Conservation Society and Surfers Against Sewage. This last one is providing means for Eastbourne to gain a plastic-free stamp of approval. This is the direction of travel, not the final destination. In other words, we're not intending Eastbourne to have no plastic. We are adopting the principle of reduction, reuse and replacement wherever possible and desirable. This plastic-free status involves meeting five objectives, the first of which is our council passes this motion. Councils lead by example to remove single-use plastic items from your premises. Council encourage plastic-free initiatives, promoting the campaign and supporting events, participation in beach cleans, for example. A representative of the council must be named on the plastic-free coastline steering group. The second objective is 34 local businesses, that's for our town size, need to pa participate at least three single-use plastic items must be removed from these local businesses and retailers and replaced with sustainable alternatives. Third, a widespread community support for plastic-free coastlines, spreading the plastic-free message and establishing an attitude for improving the quality of our environment. For example, 50% of our colleges and universities, 30% of our schools <coughs> need to participate. Fourth, at least two local community events arranged and made open for all to attend in one calendar year. This could include beach cleans and a fundraising event. I invite you all to participate in our first event, the 24th, 25th of March, Big Spring Beach Clean. The fifth objective is local groups of stakeholders to meet at least once a year to discuss the progress of plastic-free coastlines locally. Agreeing and setting direction, meeting objectives, and completing application for official plastic free coastlines status. A flagship business employee must be a member of the group. Financial impact Eastbourne will attract tourists because it will become famous as a pioneering plastic free town. The reduction in pollution will improve our environment. An increased personal responsibility will help individual well being. Also, a communal collaboration will help our planet locally. Finally, costs of waste disposal will drop, bringing financial benefit as will reduction in single-use plastic. Thank you. Thank you very much. Right, um, Councillor Bell. <coughs> Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, nearly 200 countries have signed the United Nations resolution to eliminate plastic pollution in the seas. The UN Environment Programme, which organised the meeting, said that 8 million tonnes of plastic were dumped into the oceans every year, killing marine life and entering the human food chain. It added that at current rates there will be more plastic in the seas than fish by 2050. A million plastic bottles are bought around the world every minute, and the number will jump another 20% by 2021, creating an environment crisis some campaigners predict will be as serious as climate change. The scientists at Ghent University in Belgium recently calculated that shellfish lovers are eating up to 11,000 plastic fragments in their seafood each year. We absorb fewer than 1%, but they will still accumulate in the body over time. <coughs> the results of a study by Plymouth University caused a stir when it was reported that plastic was found in a third of UK caught fish, including cod, haddock, mackerel, and shellfish. 
Now, UK, UK supermarkets are being lobbied to create plastic free aisles. More than 480 million plastic drinking bottles were sold in 2016 across the world, up from about 300 billion a decade ago. If placed end to end, they would extend more than halfway to the sun. By 2021, this is likely to increase to 583.3 billion. Most plastic bottles used for soft drinks and water are made from highly recyclable material. Thus, then new source across the globe, efforts to collect and recycle the bottles to keep them from polluting the oceans are failing to keep up. Local councils are in a unique position to lead change within <coughs> local areas. They act as consumers using single-use plastics in canteens, meetings and during daily business. Their influencers have direct access to the running of businesses and community organisations. Finally, they work as a political body, body often with cross-party members showing unity on an action, and this can instill confidence and determination to succeed. Our council should pass this resolution to support plastic-free coastlines, committing to plastic-free alternatives and supporting plastic-free initiatives within the constituency. Councils should lead by example to remove single-use plastic items from their premises, encouraging plastic-free initiatives and promoting the campaign and supporting events. I submit that this council supports the motion. Thank you. <coughs> Councillor Down. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I'm, I'm very happy to second this um, for many reasons. Um, one, which is very close to my heart, my, I took my family out to Africa to work in a remote Uganda village last summer um, because it is very apparent why the majority of the plastic in our seas comes from developing countries and third world countries. Because when you're finding the, 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 the motivation to go and find food and develop uh, income for your family at such a basic level, you can see there are no processes for them to think about recycling. So it falls incumbent on us to do even more in that, in, 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 to, to support from that point of view. Um, I would also uh, add that Councillor Murray has set up a Greening Eastbourne group, which um, includes myself, Councillor Wallace, and four members of the public, Rob Price, Will Callaghan, Spencer Reed, and Nick Adler. And it's very much centered around finding ways to improve the um, overall community of Eastbourne. The green theme runs through our, our Liberal Democrat blood. Um, and one of those things that we've already put into action is to talk to Phil Evans, who's head of tourism, and ask him to provide a report within the next six months on how Eastbourne could go completely plastic free. And so when you're thinking about all the events, you're thinking about the beer festival and the concerts and um, outdoor events that we run, how can we deliver those completely plastic free? And we're looking forward to a plastic free 2019 and those plans are already in place. Just moving forward from an individual level, so thinking about the council, how the council can lead that from an individual level. Um, my family applied the Pareto principle, which is 80-20, we want to reduce our plastic usage by 80%. And so we do things like, we go to the butchers now, and we take our containers with us, and our, our butcher now puts our meat in a container which we take home to avoid going to the supermarkets and buying their, 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 their chicken and so forth in the plastic containers. It's very good to see Iceland taking a, a move to be plastic free within the next, I think it's three years, within the next three years. It'd be good to see other supermarkets following that vein, but I'm very pleased to um, second this motion. I think it's an excellent one, and I think Mr. Stern did a fantastic Thank you very much. Thank you. Does anyone else wish to speak on this? Uh, Councillor Robertson. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll fully support this motion. Um, I'm old enough to remember in the old days when I went to school, bottles of milk and glass and recyclable. We wash and we use. I think we are turning the cycle round now. A bit like fashion going in a circle, and um, so we must reuse, we must encourage our local shops to not use plastic. We are killing our fish, and in the long run, we're killing ourselves after all we eat fish. I welcome all the support and hope everyone will back this motion. It is for our future, for our kids as well, and I know we're a bit old-fashioned, but there are ways we can go back and do things the old way before plastic was brought in. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Thank you very much. I think we're speaking a lot tonight. But the reason that I'm standing up here now 
to support this motion is because I'm a avid angler and I often go to the beach. And because I'm not the um, but a successful angle you ever see, but I do have times when I'm sitting there just looking back, you know. And this occasion happened to me just on Monday. And I was sitting on the beach in a competition. And I was looking around, and what did I see but plastic on the beach? I thought, well, actually, I'm just going to pay attention because I know that I always do see this plastic on the beach. And when I looked at what was near me, there was a, a bottle that was really worn, probably in the sea for ages. There was um, some bits of plastic that were quite hard, but I couldn't figure out where they came from. Maybe a barrel that broke or something. There's a few of those. I found a plastic bag up, a reeled in. I thought I'd really had a big fish. I reeled it in, reeled it in. By the time it came up, it was just a big white bag full of water. So I was disappointed, but it really did bring home to me the issue of plastic in our seas. And it's something that Angling clubs have been aware of for not just yesterday, but the day before, the year before, and in fact the last 10, 20 years. Some clubs have rules that say if you're fishing on the beach and you find rubbish on the beach, you pick it up and take it home and dispose of it properly. Whether or not it's your rubbish, it doesn't matter. Pick it up and take it home. I think beach cleans are fantastic, a lot of angling clubs. Uh, organise those and I've been part of those in the past but I would say don't wait for a, a clean put five minutes on the seafront pop down and pick up some rubbish there and then and get rid of it because it can't wait I can remember in the 60s when New York <coughs> was dumping tons and tons of that's all sorts of rubbish in the sea big barges going out to sea just dumping it all and I'm sure a lot of the tides have bringing that all the way up to, this, to our country. Because it is something that affects all of us. Our actions affect other countries. Other countries' actions affect us. As Councillor Dow was saying, poverty does actually uh, increase people's um, inability to care as much for the planet as they would wish. So I do think that this is a fantastic motion but we should also be talking to our neighbour councillors and speaking to the government and saying, look, you've got to really get on board here. I think that it's a, an issue that isn't just about humans. You know, the last time I called the cod hearing storm was oh, quite a few years ago. But it had, around its neck, one of those four can beer um, connectors. Now, luckily, the fish hadn't grown too much, but people have told me about how fish have those things stuck around their neck and they grow into them. How ghastly, what an awful pen for a poor animal. And that is what some of this plastic does. It is killing us, it is killing our seeds. And we really need to be ensuring that not only we as a town do this, but we as a nation and we as a world tackle these issues. So I really think this is a very timely and very important issue that we should all support in a really positive way of saying, yeah, this all have done something. Tomorrow, go out and pick some rubbish up, get it in the recycling, and maybe that will do us some good as well. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Thank you very much, Madam Mayor. Uh, yeah, I totally support this uh, motion, and can I just say, Mr. Stello for speaking and giving us some examples um, of pretty much where we are and hopefully where we're going in regards to plastic waste. It will be pretty much, I say we, um, I, I, I think there's 7 million people on this, on this planet and rising. We treated the world's ocean pretty much as a rubbish dump. Um, the oceans are vast and you know, you just chuck them in the sea, forget about it, but this problem's now coming back to bite us on the backside. Um, we have treated it as somebody else's problem. We have sent waste, plastic waste, to China uh, to be recycled. When we say recycled, we see young children from six, seven years old working in very impoverished conditions, working through um, recycling sites. What do you see here? But massive tips, um, working for epistles. And now at last, China said, actually, do you know what? Enough's enough. We're not going to take this problem anymore. 
Um, so I think we as a, a custodians really of our, of our planet um, really do need to look after it. Also in agreement with our Prime Minister, who said that uh, we want to cut all avoidable plastic waste by 2042. I'll go a bit further actually, I'd like to lobby the Prime Minister to bring that date forward. Um, I like reachable targets, but I think um, when we put our minds together from all over the country, then we can we can make things happen a lot quicker. Now, we've got two and a half billion um, disposable coffee cups that are used each year. And coffee cups, if you think of them, um, a lot of them look as if they're just cold, but you can recycle them. You can't. They've got a plastic coating on the outside. Um, it's not a simple case of recycling them. And the big coffee shops, the cost of Starbucks, have been warned about this, this for years. Um, Kelsey Dell's actually right about Iceland the supermarket just for five years, um, but they've pledged to, to get rid of waste. But actually, do you know what? Most things, most um, items that we buy, I mean, Kelsey Dell's have talked about going to the butchers, um, but most fruit and vegetables we buy comes in its own natural packaging. I saw a thing where bananas were packaged up with a plastic um, polystyrene bottom and a, uh, on top, with then a sticker and a barcode. But it only comes in its own blue packaging, for crying out loud. Onions come in their own packaging, oranges, uh, potatoes, melons, you know, all these good things come in their own packages. But what do we do? We buy them either in con and, uh, convenient little pots, because we can't be bothered to cut them up ourselves. Um, you know, we've got to take some responsibility for ourselves. Um, so, actually, support this motion. Uh, Mr. Turner, thank you for the. Uh, uh, advertisement of the 24th, 25th of March. I know myself and certainly some of my colleagues will be down um, to lend a hand and actually hope that's a start because you're right, we, we look at the beaches, not just the beaches, but actually everywhere we go, there's plastic, single use plastic in many things um, and it's very easy to dismiss. But if we keep dismissing this, um, we're already in enough trouble as it is environmentally with the oceans, but if we keep dismissing this, um, we may, that problem may become irreversible. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Murray. Thank you. I don't, just want to thank uh, Councillor Dow for giving me the credit for organising that group. But it is a, uh, a group meeting thing, thing that we've done, so that's all, all together. Uh, and we're working towards sort of trying to reduce a number of things in the town centre, including bringing up the, uh, the planning policy, amongst other things. Um, there's uh, a few things that we can do which are really simple. There's a little refill app here that if you can talk to a local coffee shop and things into allowing people to come into your shop and just refill their, their bottles from there. That means that they're taking around their own bottle instead of re reusing a plastic bottle or a plastic cup. Very simple, but it doesn't cost them anything. In fact, it gives them a bit of advertising because they're actually showing people that they're, they're caring about the environment. Uh, there's also coffee shops now we were talking about the fact that um, there's a, a plastic lining to a lot of the coffee cups that we use. Um, if you take your own cup in there, they'll give you double bonus points for, or loyalty points for coming in with your own cup or discounts for, for something. Find those coffee shops that are using that in town and use them because that's the way that we're going to change the, the way that everybody else works in town as well. If everybody else sees that um, if, you, if, if you do something to save the environment, then everybody else will start doing it as well. And in our own small little way, um, myself and Alan Shuttleworth, we helped to put on the um, Shine Water Fun Day at the end of the year, into September, and that event is now going to go plastic free. So we're going to sort of do our own little bit there to sort of try and save and set an example to everybody else in town. Thank you. Councillor Taylor. Thank you, Madam Mayor. It's interesting because I very much support this. But a lot's been spoken about the plastic we see. <coughs> My concern really is the plastic we don't see. And I don't know whether anybody uses defoliating soap. If, you, uh, if you've ever bought that, I'm sure people have heard about defoliating soap. It's a soap with uh, particles in it which feel like sand and help to, uh, to defoliate your skin. Well, it, it was a program I was watching about. I was, I was using it, I certainly do not know may I use it again, because those little teeny particles 
are plastic. And that's what gets washed down into it through our sewers and gets out uh, and, and kills off our fish. And it's the it's the unto. If you if you hadn't heard of this, and don't buy soap. It's a, a, a got a defoliating element in it. Please don't. don't, 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 don't. Oh, I'm sure none of you do, especially the ones with beards. <laughs> 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 very much in support. Yes, 
uh, as the chair of planning, I do have the uh, ability to be able to be flexible with these numbers. If I've only got one or two applications in the evening, I will allow more than one or two speakers on each item. In this particular case, we had 22 speakers that lined up that evening, and um, we stuck to the rules. The entire group, sorry, the entire committee had agreed some months beforehand that if we did have a large number of speakers, we would restrict it to two speakers plus the council. The council's constitution section on probity in planning clearly states that planning decisions involve balancing the needs and interests of individual residents in the community with the need to maintain impartial decision making in what may be highly controversial circumstances. It is crucial that the planning committee demonstrates its balance receiving representations from objectors and supporters as part of determining the planning applications. <coughs> Council procedure rules prescribe that normally only one objector can be heard and only one in support of a prior written of objection. However, the word normally does give the chair a degree of reasonable flexibility in exceptional circumstances. Only speakers who have submitted written objections and applied to speak in advance can be committed to address the committee, and no new grounds of objection can be introduced at the meeting. This is to enable the applicant to be notified and given a fair opportunity to address these issues that are going to be raised. Whilst reasonably, reasonable flexibility can be applied, for instance, where there is a complex application and a large number of objectors, such flexibility should not extend so as to distort balance and the fairness to either party. Also note that in addition to members of the public, all councillors are able to address the committee in their capacity as community representatives and are not bound by the same advance notice rules. There are good reasons for all this, for instance, should the route refusal uh, application go to appeal, uh, a reason why the council's position could be significantly compromised is defending its decision is if there seems to be an allowed an unbalanced process by allowing disproportionately large number of speakers on one side of the issue over the other. In managing a meeting of the planning committee, it is important to have regard to due process, democratic fairness and efficiency. Due process was allowed, sorry, due process was followed by the meetings conducted in accordance with council rules, which fully reflect good practice and guidance. On democratic fairness, reasonable flexibility was shown in allowing two public speakers against the application together with a ward councillor. A total of 26 objections were received and the planning grounds for those objections were fully set out in the officer's report. On that basis and having regard to the fact that no new material can be introduced by speakers, the committee was fully aware of all the grounds of objection when considering the application. So it's difficult to see where there is any democratic deficit. On efficiency, there are a total of 22 speakers due to address the committee at this meeting on the various applications. It is important that the business of the meeting can be conducted with a reasonable time scale and that equal consideration is given to all applications. In the lead up to the meeting, the planning committee secretary had to, be, had to field an unreasonably large number of assistant requests, in particular from one councillor and from one member of the public. The secretary was clear from the outset as to the procedure rules but the degree to which this was not accepted and repeatedly changed could be construed as being unreasonable pressure. In such a, if such a level of pressure is repeated in the future, this should be investigated by the monitoring officer. In conclusion, this motion should be rejected on the basis that the Council's procedural rules are not undemocratic, that they are in line with national guidance and designed to ensure the efficient management of meetings and demonstrate fairness and balance to all parties. Moreover, this motion does not specify how the rules should be changed, but by implication appears to be suggesting an unlimited free-for-all position regarding speakers. This, of course, is entirely impractical in the context of the efficient management of the meetings and would leave the Council extremely vulnerable to challenges of bias against applicants in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Um, sorry, Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, it's, it's a difficult, and I support the motion because I think something has to be looked at. Uh, and, and quite frankly, when it comes to planning, it does affect an awful lot of people in East Bourne. Uh, and, it's, uh, and quite frankly, there's every, every application, there's a loser and a winner. Uh, and I think we have to make sure that those people uh, get the opportunity to hear. I've chaired panning, I've been on panning, and I've had a situation where somebody gets heated uh, over a particular application, 
They didn't even actually, they hadn't even asked to speak. But I said, no, come down. If you diffuse the aggression that you might see, see in that situation, we don't get those, hopefully, or very often. Uh, it's much better to listen to anybody you can. And if, it doesn't worry me if I go there at six o'clock, uh, if we get to 10 o'clock, we have to have a dispensation to go on beyond 10. But uh, that was not uncommon. If there are any, uh, we have to see, if it's up to the chairman to decide how many uh, applications <coughs> go forward. And I do think the chairman has the ability, it, it, in his own way, to use his own discretion, which I, I think in this particular case, Mr. Scar was representing 500 people of an association, he should, without a doubt, he should have been allowed to speak. It doesn't matter if there's only one speaker per application. On that particular one, there should be two, three, whatever. But he, he should, in his, when any represent, the whole idea of trying to limit the number of people that speak is because you might get three, four, five people, and they all say the same thing. So you say, well, why don't you all get together and have one speaker for five of you? Now, Mr. Scarlett was one speaker for 500 people. Or, or with, and, and this, I think the Liberal Democrats know that the Meat Community Association actually have a little planning committee that they, uh, that they, uh, they discuss these issues with. So it's well thought out before it comes. Uh, to uh, planning meeting, meeting. So I think what is missing, either if you, let, if you uh, allow more, much more than two or three speakers, if you're going to stick to a rigid uh, number. If not, I think, in my view, it's, it's the chairman that runs it, and the chairman should not just stick to a rule because, uh, you know, he's told he has to stick to those, that, that number of people and has to use his discretion as um, a chairman of planning, which you, you should be able to do. That's what a chairman's for. It doesn't just you have rigid rules and you stick by that. You know, you've got to be fairly flexible. The same you or Madam Mayor, you're flexible in allowing me to speak tonight. So I, I do really do think we've got to re-look at the way that happens. And it, it, it does, I think there's quite a few people, Madam Mayor, that get quite frustrated when they find out that they can't speak, even though Mr. Scarlett put a pre uh, a request to speak several days uh, prior to that. So, uh, yes, I, I want to support the motion because I think we need to set and look how I'm on county planning and we have as many speakers uh, as, as, as wish to uh, come along and speak. And uh, I, think, I think the county planning is running a more open, transparent and uh, a friendly way towards the people that, uh, that our lives are going to be changed. <coughs> All the members of the planning committee uh, need to make sure that they are responsible for those people. It is life changing for them. They do know that those people either are going to walk out of this room <coughs> devastated because they're going to have a development right next to them, uh, and they need the opportunity to be able to speak whenever, whoever it is. Thank you, Madam Mayor, for letting me speak. Thank you very much, Councillor Sandford. Thank you very much, Madam Mayor. Um, I speak as someone who has only been on the council <coughs> for a, a few years, and I was initially on the planning committee, um, and I did chair a couple of meetings, and uh, what a uh, pleasure that was to do so. Um, what I will say is on the issue of representation. And um, I will thank you as well, Mr. Scott, for your presentation as well. But um, we as councillors are elected to represent our wards, and that is why ward councillors have an opportunity to present to planning committees. So if you want to talk about representing 500 or representing the whole ward, that's what we do as councillors if we would wish to uh, present to a planning committee. And I think that we can then speak on behalf of 500 or, or even more. Um, on the issue of the openness of our planning committee compared to that of the county council, um, I, I believe that the county council have their planning committees at 10am in the morning. I definitely couldn't attend one of those because I have to work during the day. 
So how open that is to me compared to us on a place we have number 6 v 8 I'll be much more open to go to one of those. Um, but what this comes down to for me is the chairman, who, as you say, has the right to be flexible. And more often than not, we are flexible. When I chaired it, I was quite flexible. I would say, yep, two people can present this meeting, or three. But it has to be fair, because you have to have the same amount of people pre representing on, this, on both sides. Otherwise, you come across as being very, very biased. And what we do as a planning committee, we make, we make our decision based on what we have in front of us, our visits that we've take, undertaken ourselves, and from what we've heard by people coming up to present to us. If we hear four from one side, or we hear 22 from one side, and just two from the other side, it doesn't look good for us. Or it doesn't look good when it goes, it gets appealed against us. It looks like we were completely biased in our operations of planning committee. What this comes down to is being able to trust in our decision that if it does go and be appealed against, that our council is not then forking out money because we've looked biased in the decision making process. It has to be fair on both sides. And the way that it is at the moment, with the chair having the opportunity to be flexible and allowing one, one representation at minimum, or being able to say, yes, we have three on this side, three on against, because at the end of the day, we've got to be able to be able to defend our decision as a planning committee. And that's why I'm against this motion and the things that uh, Councillor Murray has said is really providing my decision on that one. Thank you very much. Thank you. Councillor Jenkins. Uh, thank you very much. A few points. Let me say, I can understand from both sides you know, that yes, we have a policy, uh, but also I, I do support the action of the itself. Um, as many members know, I've, I've sat on planning committees now, not only here but in other places, uh, going on nearly 25 years. And different councils have different policies. Um, some actually are very, very polite. They will only allow an objector to speak if actually the applicant is there uh, in, in the meeting. Whether the applicant wants to say anything or not, uh, you know, the resident can't speak unless I'm really <coughs> present. I do agree personally that this is going to should be allowed to speak. Uh, and the other place where I was involved, uh, what they did, yes, they had a policy, and that policy on normal application was potentially one in favour and one against. That's a, a normal just like a household applicant. Where you got into applicants and applications that were slightly more, uh, should we say, stressful, and uh, that was to be presented to two objectors, even if there's only one speaking plate. When you got to the major applications, and let's be honest, the one that Mr. Scarlett wanted to speak on was actually a really major application in the town centre. The normal way that that would have been handled before in, in this other place, the council kept a register of actual residents' associations and community associations. And if, that, if one of those community associations requested to speak, because they were on that register, they were allowed to. Uh, it doesn't matter whether that community association had spoken to 25 residents, of 5,000 residents. They had the option of actually speaking. Now, I do think, as I say, that uh, in this particular instance, the chairman should have allowed uh, Mr. Scar to speak for the simple reason the people that he represented. It has been said that the MCA has a planning committee within it, so they know what they're talking about. They're, they're not just coming emotionally to a, to a planning committee. We talk about the, the length of time of a planning committee. We all know that if you get near 10 o'clock, you've got the option of either closing the meeting with the guillotine or lifting that guillotine and carrying on until we finish. I actually sat on the committee once. It started at 7 o'clock in the evening. And we got out of the council chamber at half past three in the morning. 
The only incentive because of the lot of major new applications is that we have to listen to all the information available. Now, I'm not saying that's what we should do here, but you see that there are different ways of working for different councils. So I do think, potentially, a full review of the whole process, how it operates here, whether we think it's the right way of doing it or we can make a, a, amendments to it. That's why I'm supporting this motion tonight. I do hope that we get the unanimous vote here tonight because it is important that we are seen to be doing the right thing and to be acting correctly by the members of the public. Thank you. Um, Councillor Tom. Thank you, Madam Mayor. It's uh, very unusual for me to speak on land issues. I've never served on planning process, <coughs> and I have rather a jaundiced view of the planning process, to be honest. Um, um, not least of which the fact that decisions that I think should be made and uh, determined locally by people elected uh, from the residents of their community. Um, can be overturned by a planning inspector in Bristol yeah. who knows absolutely nothing about, about the local conditions in the local area. Um, and so I, I find that particularly undemocratic. Um, and it's something, it's something that I, I think needs to be changed. Um, I can also understand entirely um, what this is going to say. Uh, because I belong to planning committees with members of the public who want to protest against a particular development. And uh, several of them would want to speak, of course they may be repetitious if they've been allowed to. But they, they felt passionately that they were opposed to something. Um, and so they wanted to have their, their day in court, if I can put it like that. Which I think we all probably think is, you know, our, our very human rights. Um, the difficulty comes from, because I, I, when I read this notice motion, I did a little bit of research on it. And that, that's when I, I start to understand a little bit better the danger of allowing as many people as wish or a, a disproportionate number of people to speak on one side than on the other. Because if you do so, there is a risk that the judgment of the planning committee here could be seen as being biased and then overturned by that very uh, uh, <coughs> landing inspectorate uh, that is not based here in Eastman. So the intent could actually uh, say, well, let's let more people speak uh, who are opposed to an application, could actually be detrimental to the, uh, uh, the, the decision to do so, could be detrimental to the intent of, of trying to improve the opportunity of people have a voice to um, And in addition to that, there's a risk that we could be fined as a council for acting inappropriately. I've also asked what happens in other places. I'm grateful to Councillor Jenkins for bringing his experience in another place here. Uh, in terms of East Sussex, uh, uh, the policies that we've got are very much in line with those of other East Sussex borough district councils. Um, and so if I turn to the motion, I look at the wording of it. I, I can't something like that. We have serious concerns about the undemocratic limitation of speakers. It isn't undemocratic because it's balanced. It's balanced on, on both sides so that there, there is an equilibrium. Um, everybody has the opportunity to object in writing and that is reported. No new business can be brought into the proceedings. Um, but then the motion goes on to say a recent management meetings and suggest that procedures are amended accordingly. According to what? That, that, I mean, that, that, that is actually one of the most loosely worded notices of motions that I, I, I've ever read. And so, no, I couldn't support it, and I would ask uh, that, that it be rejected. That doesn't mean that we can't actually look at how things are done in practice, and I'm sure that the, the chair of the planning committee would have taken on board the uh, discussion this evening. Um, but if you want to change things, I think we need to national, lobby national government to bring about changes. One of the comments that Councillor Murray made, which really concerned me, was the fact that pressure had been brought on the Secretariat. The Secretariat there is there, that there are officers. It's not appropriate for either members of the public 
but even more particularly members of the council put disproportionate pressure on uh, the secretariat, I would feel very uh, annoyed if I thought that was going to become a general practice and I would want Sandy to look at it. Thank you. Councillor Friedman. Thank you very much, Madam Mayor. I'm, I'm like Councillor Sutbury when it comes to planning, I'm not quite tend to, honestly, I just tend to <coughs> step back away from it really. It's, um, it is a bit of a minefield and obviously as the Chair of the Planning Committee, it's a minefield that you have to uh, find a way through. Um, however, can I thank Mr Scar for speaking and putting some, not just speaking um, for the motion, but actually giving some examples. So some examples of last year where um, we say that the Chair has flexibility, great, but actually there needs to be some consistency. And I think what Mr Scar has highlighted over the last uh, few planning commi committee meetings, certainly over the last year, is that she hasn't been consistent. Um, and I think that's what really, to be honest, needs to be looked at. Uh, Councillor Sapri talked about the Sussex County Council when their meetings are at 10 o'clock in the morning. Wonderful. They're also webcast, Councillor Sapri. You can look at them any time you like. You can't do that on a planning committee here. Yeah, sure. So if you, were, if you were going to a planning committee, um, so there's a planning meeting here at 6 o'clock in the town hall, then you were taking it out, you've got no chance. You can't even look at the meeting. You can't even get in and have a look at it. Um, so I think I do support the motion. I've got a feeling uh, Councillor indicated perhaps several of his colleagues did as well um, that the group opposite won't be supporting this motion. Um, I may take the small olive branch where Councillor Tut did indicate that he may um, ask this to be looked at. Um, so if my suspicions are um, that the group opposite won't support the motion. Um, is that, that it will actually be looked at because I think uh, what we do need to make sure is um, that there is some consistency. I think council table is absolutely uh, right. Uh, yeah, as councillors, yes, we can represent the ward. Um, I tend to get, we tend to get, I think, sometimes more emails about planning decisions uh, than anything else. And I, along with my two other ward colleagues, have spoken to the planning committee um, about issues before. Um, but I also think. Some of Mr. Scar, um, um, members of the public as well, shouldn't be um, excluded from that process. Um, we talk about open democracy. Um, we really shouldn't shut members of the public away or away from meetings um, when it's not going to affect me. I don't, you know, I don't live in that area. But surely, someone that's living in that area that it affects uh, deeply should actually have the chance to speak on those matters. And I think Councillor Jenkins made some quite good points actually of. Um, processing in other areas where actually if it's got a major application then perhaps three people speak. Can I just remind members of the planning committee as well, you do get an extra allowance for being on the planning committee. Yeah, they, you do. So actually if a meeting has to go on past two hours, does it really matter? It's not going to be every week down the planning committee meeting. Um, you get an extra bit of allowance for it, so um, surely that's sort of hope for um, allowing people, members of the public, uh, to be heard. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you. Is there anyone else wishing to speak on this? Oh, Councillor Bellon. Madam Mayor, I'd just like to say when I was uh, um, uh, uh, on the planning commission occasionally as a sub uh, uh, about a year ago, and there was actually a review of all these um, 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 rules and regulations that went, um, there was a paper that um, the partner introduced to. Um, the planning committee, and they did actually vote on these, um, uh, the, these rules and regulations. So I think um, if you need another review, you need to go back to square one because it was actually voted on in the group. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Anyone else? Right. This gives us Thank you, Madam Mayor. Well, uh, and thank you all councillors for your contributions. And as I said, I was hoping this was a fairly non contentious area. Uh, I'm sorry, Councillor Tutte, if the wording of the motion is being vague. And that was meant to be non prescriptive. And merely indicate, I mean, at the very least, you would recognise the wording in this meeting in terms of the, the way it works now. I think there's a general consensus, perhaps, that um, uh, uh, somebody representing an uh, association of 500 households might have a slightly different position than, than, than an individual. 
But as Councillor Taylor has indicated, these are often life-changing decisions for people, where people have been excluded from coming to the meeting, where they actually live next to the doors of development. And that will still be true on, 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 on this, this, particular, this particular day. Um, in conclusion, I, I hope that, that people will not vote necessarily just to turn this down, but to give some positive way forward. I would really quite like to have there been some amendment uh, from, from other councillors, uh, given that the wording was relatively vague and intentional. So, thank you. Thank you. We're going to move to a vote now. So, uh, those in favour of the motion. Those against. Central government are making huge cuts to local councils, getting them to take on the burden of austerity. Our budget reflects the difficult decisions we have had to make in the town to keep the books balanced. Luckily, because of foresight and good planning, these cuts have been kept to a minimum. Planning is under similar pressures. Central government are lifting old planning restrictions in some areas, making it easier for people to build. They are setting very high targets for every town in the country to build new houses. This board has to build approximately 500 each year, but at the moment we're not hitting that target. The knock on of this is that we, as a forward looking innovative council, have had to start changing the way we look at some developments. To use Councillor Freebody's phrase, we have to live within our means, or should I say, try to live within the restrictions thrust upon us by the central government. Where we previously had the red lines that we would not cross, we are having to reconsider and start using the same foresight and forward plan that we have used effectively in other areas to help us consider each case individually, but also taking into consideration the challenge that if we do not meet these targets, we will lose control of planning at a local level, and we cannot let that happen. Thank you. Um, the highways 
great um, um, advice comes from the Sussex County Council. Uh, Councillor Smart's absolutely right. Uh, I think that uh, the way that they conducted some of their traffic surveys and the way that they applied uh, the, uh, their own rules in terms of the number of parking spaces required in a particular area uh, is inappropriate. Uh, I criticised that at the plan on, with regard to a planning application recently. And uh, I know another application is coming to that site. I made representations uh, by the planning team here to ask that they actually use the parking requirements for the ward that the, uh, the application is in, not the two adjoining wards which have a lower requirement. Uh, but I, I believe that, that, that we may have seen a repeat of what they did before. Um, and I will be taking that issue up uh, with County Highways because. Uh, I think that the advice that they're giving, uh, we, we have no, as a planning uh, um, committee, a planning committee have no choice but to accept that because they are the people appointed to advise on highways and parking matters. Uh, and that actually rather worries me. Um, with regard to what Councillor Murray was saying in terms of oh. planning targets, it's another part of planning that I think is bonkers. Uh, I think that the government targets in terms of the number of homes for East Wall is beyond our ability to deliver. And I think that's also true for many other uh, councils in the southeast of England. And the, the threat that if we fail to deliver on those targets, those planning decisions will be taken out of our hands and that we are going to draw our green belt it, it is really outrageous. Thank you. Anyone else wish to speak? Oh, sorry, Councillor Oh, People know I've chaired planning for four years. One of the hardest things about planning is the car parking. Dealing with people coming and speaking to us is really important, and I didn't enter that debate because it's one that we've been thrashed on because we've got the flexibility. To have uh, that maybe that flexibility is something should be taken away. That's a different point. The issue of parking in the town centre is actually you can't park in the town centre nine times out of ten. Just can't do it. So why are we then saying that we don't want people to come to the town centre? There are a lot of people who want to live in the town centre who don't want to park a car because they don't want to own a car. They want to be able to walk to their local shops, local amenities, and live in a local community. So we will be offering people a green alternative in that particular plan. And I think that's a very positive thing. Now, when I bought my house many years ago, about 30 years ago, one thing that my wife said to me that actually made me decide that was the house we were going to buy was because she said, you know what? We can get our car on the drive there. We don't need to worry about parking on the street. So I actually purchased a house that had a drive. Now, I'm out and about in Old Town, so I do need a car, get around, needed to work at the time. But now I'm retired. If I was living in a town centre, I wouldn't need a car. It would be nice to have an opportunity to buy somewhere where I could live, not having a car, not having the impact that a space for a car would have on the environment. So I would feel, you know, my own green credentials, and I'd feel much better for that. And that's what I think that scheme is giving the option for. I think that we need more schemes that allow for people not to have cars. So that way, we're helping the environment. It's something that we can do in a positive way to stop more pollution. Our council is saying we want even more traffic in our town centre? Is that what they're saying? I think they have thought this through. Once again, it's sort of, you know, we're being flexible on allowing people to speak and we get hammered for being flexible. We're now saying we don't want to be flexible, we can't be, and we're being hammered for that. You can't win either way. It does make me wonder sometimes. Thank you. Councillor Bell. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Just a couple of points, really. The former police station, I'm not on the planning committee, but I'm aware that the former police station has no vehicle access to it. So how you would provide parking within that building where the first conversation was, could we provide an underground car park, it wasn't feasible. Um, 
I also support this application going through, even though, again, like I say, I'm on the planning committee, because I think it supports young people getting on the housing ladder. I think it provides small accommodation, flats, one bedroom flats and so on, that allows young people an opportunity in town centre accommodation who may well be commuters, who may well use the, the train station to get to drive from work, maybe go to London to work, and also at the weekend they probably walk into town rather than drive. There's no need to, um, to do anything other than walk or cycle because of the location and locality of this development. So I absolutely um, think this is the right thing to do, um, and uh, I'm glad that this application went through and it will make, make this building an added value to the town centre of Eastport. Thank you. Thank you. Councillors Preverly. I wasn't going to speak. <laughs> I wasn't. Um, but I do think they're a bit naive. Right? Councillor Rundle, when you say about um, I agree with you actually, we need to reduce the amount of cars um, in our town centre, the amount of cars we are travelling to work. You see the traffic jams, etc. every day. Um, but I'm not sure providing no car parking space is going to make one ounce of difference. All that is going to make an ounce of difference too are the neighbouring properties within that area because there's 50 odd uh, units there. And are you telling me that all of those people living there aren't going to have a car? Absolutely not. So that, so, and you're saying there's nowhere at the moment to park in the town? Well, there's even fewer spaces now because there will be, or will be, not except uh, areas developed, because there will be people living in that development that will have cars, that will have to park on maybe the streets, and as Councillor Smart and myself and many others here know, there simply aren't enough um, car parking spaces in the amount of units there are in the town at the moment. So, I understand where you're coming from, but it doesn't make sense, and it's just putting a burden, and it's just putting more of that burden onto people who live in that area. Uh, Thank you, Madam Chair. Just a point of clarification, I think probably you could have had some other ground. Oh, oh, no. That wasn't the only thing with that application because obviously lack of car park is an issue. But for me, in some ways, it was the number of flats that were been two more floors that were put on top of the police station at the rear end. That's what worried me is that. You're saying that you need flats with no um, parking in the town centre because there are a number of people that don't want to serve them. They don't want to drive a car. You have to also take into consideration the density of what was, that is proposed with that. So we're not having another debate about the planning application. We're talking about um, the fact that it hasn't got enough car parking. I'll go along with that. It, it doesn't. But nevertheless, it is, uh, in my view, it wasn't And we vote on that. Uh, 
I found that particular this uh, this particular um, uh, application was that there was no other choice of thinking of this body because there was no another way we could think of it. But to lose those facts was not a big option either. So I personally voted for it. It's because I felt like this is very important. We could do that. We can argue things. These things we can't just decide overnight. These things are an issue that we can go on and on. And we should look at the national situation where if we believe that we can go for anything special, as our chairman has already mentioned, we can go and argue for it, and I'm sure we can get something. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Well, I do still panic, and I can't believe an application went through with no parking. And at the end of the day, there was parking on this site. The police used to park there. And they were shown at planning, if they didn't want to develop as many houses as they wanted to put there as many flats, there was allocation for parking. It's just that they wanted to build more and more flats. So when the question came up about emergency <coughs> services and, and house refuse going to be removed, they're all going to park in Grove Road. They can't get into the, this uh, new development. So I had concerns that I've never seen an application go through with no parking. And when I started looking up, you know, the provisions of the right amount of type of parking is key in helping to deliver successful and sustainable developments. As Councillor Ongar said, perhaps we should sell them to say you can't have a car if you live here. Can't see that one working. At the end of the day, we know young people, it's the young people, and I predominantly think these well people that's in town, everyone wants a car. We all have sons and daughters guaranteed first thing on the list, what a load of drive, what a car. So there was a way, there was parking here, the police parked here. We could have at least provided some parking, but the way the development was developed this site, it was for maximum units and no parking, which was quite a concern. So at the end of the day, I think it's something we need to bring our own parking sort of plans in because if we rely on these static, I agree, sometimes. They don't want to respond, and there's nothing better. So we need to look at things carefully in this way because we know Grove Road isn't very big. And if there is a situation when this development's been built, that they need emergency services, or even when the refuse are going to go there weekly, fortnightly, they are all going to be parked in Grove Road trying to get all the bins out of this development. So is that going to stop the road from working? Or are we going to sort of rearrange how the road works? It's just that. I think we should have looked at this more but not just put it through quickly to say no parking. Thank you. Thank you. Um, is, if no one else wants to speak, um, we're, that's the end of the discussion. Okay. Right, so, yes. If uh, we still have item 11, the council will approve the rest of item 11. Thank you. That concludes our meeting.